Hello and welcome to another FAQ episode. And this is, I believe, FAQ 9. So season four, FAQ 9. As always, I'm just gonna get started. Dean sent me this. I printed it out. I haven't even looked at it yet. I like to be candid and that's how we do the FAQs. So I'm gonna get started reading these. And if you have questions that you want answered, you can comment in any of our videos, ask your question. You can post it in this video and we'll be going through it to make sure we do as much question answering as possible. However, if it's urgent, you can always email support at buildasoil.com and get an answer from our customer service team. One of the most important things we wanna do is provide the best potting soil and the best ingredients for the living soil lifestyle with no compromise to quality. And we've, we, we can talk for a long time about the ingredients that are used by other companies and how we do things. But to complement that, once you get started in the build a soil way, we want to be here for you to have customer service that knows how to grow, to answer your questions, to be able to email, talk on the phone, watch our YouTube series, and just learn. And so this FAQ is a big part of that for us. We really wanna support you and make sure that no question goes unanswered. So thank you so much for, for asking. I'm just gonna jump in and get started. Jonathan says, I'm upgrading my two by four no-till bed into a three by three bed. Should I buy new soil or just transfer the soil from the old bed into the new one? Or is there any drawbacks to this? Great question. With that two by four, that is about eight cubic feet if it's one foot deep. A lot of times they're two feet deep, which means you have 16 cubic feet. And on that three by three, it's nine. So two times four is eight, three by three is nine. You're very close. Whether it's 18 cubic feet in the three by three, because it's two feet deep, or whether it is 16 cubic feet in the two by four, because it's two feet deep. So I would highly recommend that you use your no-till soil, so to speak, your recycled soil. I don't see any downside to that. I love to reuse our soil. I mean, I'd like to just say, yes, buy new soil, go to our website, but I honestly feel like you should be using all of that. And I would put it in the bottom. And when I go to dump it all out, I would break it up all like I'm making fresh soil. You can put it in your three by three, break it all up, make sure that it looks beautiful. And if you notice maybe the texture, like maybe some of the organic matter's broken down and maybe you wanna add a little more drainage, or maybe there's something texturally like that that you notice, feel free to improve the texture so that it's gonna last a long time into the future. But the reason why we use pumice and the reason why we have the ratios the way we do is they last a very long time. I would put that in the bottom and then I would put fresh soil on the top to make up the couple cubic feet that you're missing out on to set up your three by three. And I think you're gonna do a great job. So don't overthink it. The only thing that I wanna be cognizant of is the texture. So if there's very little drainage in your soil because you've used it for so long back to back in your two by four, and you dump it out and you can notice it's all worm castings basically and there's worms in it, it might be a good idea to add some more pumice or some drainage material. On the other hand, if you've been using that two by four and you had some time between cycles and it wasn't overused, so to speak, over back to back to back, the texture's probably perfect and it'll be really easy to just dump in and get right. So hopefully that helps. I think I have a cup of coffee. Let me grab it right now. All right, so Eric says, hello, Jeremy. My question is in adding minerals to my mix. Okay. I live down in South Texas and a very rural place and it's hard to get products shipped because it's prohibitively expensive for me. Listen, I get it. That's why I started build a soil. I was going to different websites and all the shipping was insane and I was looking for rare ingredients. So I couldn't buy them all in one spot. My question is with decomposed granite from Home Depot. How good is that going to be as one of my additives for my mineral mix? Thank you so much for the excellent insight and experience that you share with this community. Eric, I'm really glad you, uh, you asked this question because to me, this is what build a soil is all about. I wanna teach how to be independent based on understanding what the inputs are, as opposed to saying you must buy it from build a soil. Now there's a lot of products that we get that I think are really special. So if I teach about them, a lot of times people do order from us. My favorite rock dust to get is to go get some basalt. We carry basalt at build a soil. You can use that for your mineral mix. We used to use glacial rock dust kind of exclusively. And then we found out about basalt and shifted direction for a while we used both. Basalt is my favorite. Essentially, I just want a lava flow. But when you read about where a lot of this information come from, came from, in the beginning, we were um, going to a website, remineralize.org, and there was a, a book on there called Bread from Stones. You can find it at the Build a Soil blog, and there's a free download. But Bread from Stones, you can Google it. Just find the PDF. It's a free book because it's so old. It's one of the original books on rock dust, and they talk about granite a lot. And what we learned in remineralize.org 
is that what you're looking for is rock dust that's local to you. Now, when it comes to our potting soils, we're very particular about heavy metals and we make sure we get the best product. But for the most part, I wouldn't be scared as a home grower, especially from rock dust. And from how I understand it, geographically on the East Coast, granite is gonna be a really good choice. Where on the West Coast, you might have access to glacial and basalt. And that really is just a matter of freight. And so another website that we carry products from is rockdustlocal.com. You might want to check them out. Sometimes they have specials. They've got lots of rock dust. But in that book, Bread from Stones, they use granite, decomposed like ground up granite as their rock dust of choice. And it is of benefit. And so I would be very into using that. I wouldn't be against it at all. So great question. If you're watching this and you have access to granite, um, try it. I think you get really good results. We're trying to build a soil and not be so specific about getting every benefit from every product. Otherwise, we might make it, make it cost prohibitive. The number one goal is to get some seeds and clones going. Just get this started. So use the granite. I think you'll be fine. As far as volume, I would use it the same as all other rock dust, and that's one to two cups per cubic foot. That works out to 50 to 100 pounds per yard, kind of depending. So hopefully that helps. Uh, let's see. Luke, awesome, man. You're looking well and happy. Thank you. I'm enjoying the vibes and information. What's your opinion on allowing the root zone to dry out very dry and in timing with the harvest? Do you think it would be advantageous to harvest with dry soil or not? Cheers. I don't know about going to bone dry, right? But there is a conversation out there. You can start looking it up called crop steering. And crop steering, I'm not too into the hydro side as far as trying to feed the plant at an exact amount, doing tissue testing and constant soil testing. I don't feel it's necessary. And even if it was, I feel like there's a lack of structure to getting that perfect when it comes to mixed media, potting soil, and all of the differences that we have going on. And a lot of the best growers that I, that I know, they research crop steering and they research all the new things that are out there and they take all that information in to their process and they understand how it might work for them. And one of the things I know about crop steering, which I'm not an expert on, is that a lot of people are playing with the ebb and flow of that moisture and getting that right, having some dry down periods where you're not constantly soaking wet. And this makes a lot of sense to me. How I hand water is not to be in there keeping it soaking wet. I like to water to peak capacity and then I like to let that dry down a little until it gets to the low end of my range and then I water it back up. And occasionally, instead of going all the way back up, I'll keep it in some sort of middle moisture range until I get closer to stretch or when the plants are big and then I'll test upwards of getting to the most amount of water holding. And so that creates a, a, a flow. And so when I think about that, I do think that crop steering and dry down might have some good effects. But when it comes to fully getting bone dry, I don't want to defeat the point of living soil. And that's to keep it alive, keep the plants happy. I wouldn't take it to a wilt point and using those eco wit sensors, you might be able to dial in exactly where that's at for you. Um, but I do see some benefit and it's just kind of natural, meaning when the plants are ripening, I'm not in there watering the same amount. And what I've noticed in big beds of soil is you can go the last two, three weeks without even watering in the sense that they're not growing as fast, they're not drinking as much, they're not transpiring as much. So a lot of times towards the end, we might be overwatering without noticing and causing more issues, especially humidity could be higher at the end. And so everybody's going to have their own method. I do think that there's validity in having some sort of ebb and flow to the moisture. There's even people playing with blue mats to uh, tinker in these dry down periods or unplugging them at the end. You do what you want. I don't think it's going to be make or break, but I definitely think that there's more intuition and there's more value in watering in a cycle that has some differences as opposed to constantly being exactly the same. So uh, take that for what it's worth. Boot says, Jeremy, what are your thoughts on adding extra aeration to the soil with auto parts like extra pumice or maybe those air domes that go into the bottom? So I think you meant the auto pots and I do agree, but in the small, in the small auto pots that I was running, it was taking up more of the space of the container that could have been used for soil. And the other thing is in that type of container, there's kind of a perched water table. So even if I, I put more pumice in, it would still be heavily moist under there and I want the wicking to happen. So I'm not positive if that would really be the goal. I do think adding the air dome would probably make a lot of sense, but in the past, I've stayed away from things like that because if the air dome goes out, a lot of times it really makes the plant react negatively. I've also noticed that anaerobic style, not having it completely loaded with that oxygen the entire time in the root zone, I feel like it creates a terpier, more, like a louder plant. It's like it had to work harder or something. 
I don't have evidence for that. And so this is just feelings that I have. And this is through thousands of conversations with lots of growers. So take it for what it's worth. We're gonna be doing the XXL, I think, in the next grow. I haven't decided how many plants or exactly how I'm gonna do it. Um, but since we're going to fabric pots, I doubt I'll go to the Aerodome this time. But maybe we'll put an Aerodome in one and not the other and kind of see if there's a difference. So good thoughts. I just don't always like putting lots of drainage in the bottom of the containers. It takes more room that soil could have been there. So that's kind of my thought, okay? MVS says, trichomes are only made during lights on. There's no evidence that 48 hours of darkness does anything other than stop chlorophyll production. They are now thinking that 48 hours of lights on before chop will help, but what do you think? I, I don't experiment in, the, in my life, right, in harvesting when I want. I wouldn't put much thought into tinkering with 48 hours of light at the end or 48 hours of darkness. To me, this is an entire process and all of it needs to be done right. At the same time, I don't think you're gonna hurt anything by doing 48 hours of darkness or 48 hours of light other than extending it for two days longer. And if that gets you two days longer, I think that's good because a lot of people are trying to harvest early. So those are my thoughts. Twisp says, hi, Jeremy, in the tropical tent, how come you didn't top dress the lychee tree with craftland, kashi, or castings? Wouldn't that help it bounce back? You know, I'm new to trees and I didn't want to overdo it. And what you didn't know is in that soil, I had top dressed quite a bit and grew cover crop in there and tilled it all in. And that soil was pretty rich as far as nutrients. And so my concern was not overdoing it. I will say we're going to be readdressing that because I'm happy to report, I'll show you in a new video, there is a massive amount of growth happening on that tree now. And I was being really shy on watering just to make sure I didn't overwater, and that was not the recipe. A little, a little growth spurted out and it was going slow. My wife got in there and she mentioned it was a little dry. I think I watered it, she started watering it, and now it is just throwing down with new growth. So now I'm more confident than ever we're gonna have some lychee fruit. And you'll notice it's also bare. I don't normally do that, and I've been struggling to find time to document everything I want in the tropical, but we are gonna address that. Mulch, top dressing, all of that soon, and we will mention it. So really good point. Uh, let's see, Lil J says, I know this might be premature, but can we have a 45 minute smoke report? Can you get Miles back in there or even other employees behind the scenes? Let's go. You know, I think this is really good. I do wanna have, a lot of it's just scheduling, right? Like the employees are super busy. They're always on the phone. We don't have unlimited staff. We're a small company. And so like even right now, I'd rather have a staff member holding the camera, but I just, Damon's on the phone. The rest are down at shipping. We shift resources when we get behind because of weather. And so today I'm sitting here in my office talking to a camera by myself. And believe me, it'd be way more fun to have Miles in here, maybe do another smoke report. So I am finishing trimming that and I'd love to do it. No promises, but I don't see why not. Jek, J-E-K says, thank you for all the content and knowledge. My question is, how important is environment when the plants are, are off? This is a good question. As long as it doesn't get too extreme on temps or humidity, does it affect the plants that much? Thanks again. Um, no, so the environment basically doesn't matter. And what I mean by that is, obviously the environment matters when it comes to mold and flowering or being like negative 10 degrees or something wild, right? But as far as the importance that we place on VPD while the plants are in lights on, that's because we're driving the plants to use their energy. And if we don't have the environment dialed in the VPD right, they're gonna run low on humidity, have to move more moisture, causing more energy usage. They may react negatively to the light because they don't have enough food and water and moisture and they're getting overdriven because the humidity wasn't right. And so it can totally affect things. But when it comes to lights off, I basically don't worry about it. In fact, I program my Niwa to increase the exhaust so that the humidity doesn't spike at night because I'd rather have lower humidity and more airflow and it also gives me a little bit cooler night, right? I want the night to be cooler, the day the light's on to be warmer. Uh, when it comes to flower, I am concerned. One of the things you can do is when you go, oh, VPD doesn't matter, and you just ignore the nighttime, is sometimes you can have warm nights with trapped in humidity and no exhaust and no airflow, and it can really ruin an entire grow. So as far as keeping things clean and air moving and the humidity not too high so that you don't get mold, important. As far as VPD, the lights aren't on, there's no reason to be dialed in on that. So hopefully that helps. Let's see, Ranger. Shout out to Jeremy, appreciate all the info on organic living soil. About to pull down my largest, loudest yield in the last 10 years. Yes, Ranger, thank you for sharing. This is what it's all about. I've tinkered with so many methodologies and ultimately quality is the most important thing to me. But successful people that I know, good growers that I know, they don't settle for just one, they want both the best quality, the best yield, the best feeling about how they did it, knowing they did it their way instead of following some part A, part B like Campbell's soup. They actually built it from scratch. 
they used their best judgment and they harvested a bumper crop of the best quality. That's what loyal to the soil means. That's the build a soil way. And those are the feedback that really get me going. I absolutely love hearing that. I was on the phone the other day. I walked by, somebody's on the phone. I jumped in and he was explaining some of his process. We got to talking and at the end he told me, hey, look, I'm disabled. I was forcing myself to grow in two, three gallon containers thinking that that was the best way for me being disabled. And he switched. I think he's doing 15 to 30 gallon containers, had a little help setting it up and now is able to run it by himself and increase the yield significantly. Lower plant count, but much healthier, better yield, better quality across the board. And so a lot of times we lose the forest through the trees and it's important that we look at why we started this to get the best quality, but don't miss out on yield. And the build a soil way is absolutely both. So Ranger, thank you so much. Dane says, I'm sure it's been asked before, but for a future season, would you consider doing an all clone scrog in one of the beds? Interested in seeing this process. We've done it in the past. We'd be happy to do it in the future. We're actually making decisions on what to do for season five right now. One of the things I would like to do is some clones. In fact, I got a mom back here of one of the keepers from the Fruit by the Funk that I think I want to run again. And so I'm deciding what I'm going to do next, but we'll probably record up potting that mom, pruning it back and growing it into excellent health so we can take those clones for the next round. But part of me wants to grow some seeds as well. So over the next week, I'm really going to sit down and make sure that I pick exactly what we're going to do, run it by all the members on Discord and the Patreon group because they're supporting our YouTube channel, right? Which we couldn't ask for more. And so I want to run it, run it by them and then we will make an announcement. So yeah, I would definitely consider it. No promises, but we're making decisions in the next week. So look out for that announcement. Thanks, Dane. Thanks everybody who asked. And that's all the questions that I had written on this piece of paper. Again, like usual, subscribe, like, tell your friends about this. If you got your questions answered, share it. It really helps the algorithm when more people interact and it keeps us going here with orders. Appreciate you as always. If you want more comments or I'm sorry, more questions like this answered, put your questions out there. Make sure that you're interacting with our videos. And I promise as we go through here, we're going to keep adding more and more FAQs to these seasons as I know they do make a big difference. So thanks again for watching. I appreciate each and every single one of you. And until next time, I'll see you guys on the next Build a Soil FAQ video.